All right. So this is Whitney from Get the Pancake, a podcast for volleyball coaches. Today, we have Dr. Jacob Swart with us to answer some of our physical therapy related questions. So strength training, uh, recovery. I did ask on my Instagram stories for everyone to ask what questions they have for Dr. Jacob Swart. And I was pretty overwhelmed with the amount of questions that we got. So I think there were 30 to 40 questions that we received. And we're going to get through as many as possible because I know each question is really important. So we're going to cover as much as possible. I did pick out some of the most common questions and also a few specific ones that I would like to know the answer to myself. Um, Not everything is 100% physical therapy related. There are a few big picture questions related to injury. And I thought it'd be interesting to get Jacob's thoughts on those as well. So Jacob, thank you for being on the podcast. (laughs) Yeah, of course. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to get after some of these questions. Volleyball is definitely something that I enjoy a ton of. And uh, you guys have some really good questions that we're going to be able to get into. Yeah, so we're starting out. We're going to talk about how to strengthen your ankles, what ages to introduce strength training, specifically how to train liberos. And then, of course, the question that almost everybody asked, it seemed like, was how to increase your vertical. So let's go ahead and just get started. We are going to take a second later to learn more about Jacob, but we'll dive into a couple of these questions first. So, Jacob, our first question is how to strengthen your ankles when you're dealing with chronic ankle sprains. Um, And then maybe if you could talk about so my ankles are definitely strong. something that are close to my heart. I've had, I, I'm a chronic ankle sprainer myself, or at least I was in high school. I've had two ankle surgeries and I've probably done it to my ankles. So this is definitely something <laughs> that I want to help people out with as much as I can. Strengthen your ankles, man. A lot of this comes down to like ankle control um, and ankle stability. Your ankle is a really mobile joint. It's sitting on top of your foot, which is made up of a ton of joints itself. So stability is going to be the name of the game for your ankles. And what's really cool about the ankle, what makes it so complex is it's what we call a multi-planar joint. So it's going to move in a bunch of different directions. So it's kind of like your shoulder where it can move like in a full Mm -hmm. circle. uh, And that complicates things. I mean, it it allows it to do its job. Your ankles are meant to move, but stability becomes a big picture. So if I'm going to be working with athletes and I'm really working on ankle stability or working on preventing ankle sprains, trying to be preventative with um, Mm -hmm. our training, man, one of the things that I'm going to be focusing a ton on is lateral ankle strength. So What I mean by that is strengthening up the outside of the ankles. And one of my favorite drills for this for me, it's a really simple drill. It's not anything new and you're not going to be able to blast on Instagram and get a bunch of followers from it. But I love to do banded lateral shuffles. So you're going to be uh, (laughs) kind of like, yeah, right. But here's the trick for it. You got to put that band around your toes, right? So around the, around like what's called the distal portion of your foot. So getting it out far close to your toes with that band, that's going to get your ankles on fire. And, uh, that's a really easy drill to do with a big group of people too. If you, if, you know, if you get, so we're going to take the bands and we're going to um, put them around our toes essentially. And then we're just shuffling side to side. Yeah. You're going to be in a nice control. So you're going to be in like an athletic stand. So you can make it really volleyball related. You can get, have them in like a ready position, Perfect. you know, and then you can go side to side with that. You could try to make it a little bit more volleyball related where, you're going to maintain that distance between your feet, but then like take a step forward, like you're going to go after a ball and, and hold and hold that band position, not let it pull your foot. And they're in. going slow um, while doing this. It's not like they're trying to run. Ideally, <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, you're not running. Okay. Running. Yeah, it's it's definitely like a controlled Control, motion. Okay. Um, yeah, control is the name of the game. And then anytime you can get into single leg work as well, because you think about sports in general, or whenever you run or when you take a quick step, uh, you're very rarely are you on one foot. And when you roll your ankle, it's typically when you're coming down from a jump position. So being able to have like some good single leg stability uh-huh. is going to be really important too. So a lot of times I'm going to get people, you can get them on like, you should literally get them in a, in a, in a single leg stance and, and do different volleyball specific drills where you, you know, have them like, you know, throw a volleyball back and forth to them. Mm-hmm. As, as it can be as simple as that. Have them get it up in teams, make it a competition, make it fun. You are dealing with athletes and athletes like to be right. competitive. So, I mean, it's a long-winded answer <laughs> for really some simple things that work really well and can be really effective if done consistently. But I'm going to be working on single leg stance work. I'm going to be working on lateral ankle strength. So strengthening up the outside of that ankle. 
All right. That is really great to know. I also sprained my ankle coming down after a block. So strengthening the outside and doing some uh, single leg work and then banded lateral movements, you said? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Those are, those are two great places to start. Awesome. I know a lot of people will probably be getting those bands out and trying that at their next practice. We also had mm-hmm. another question. Speaking of ankles, someone asked, mm-hmm. are ankle braces beneficial even if your ankles are not injured? Ah, man. So yes and no. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. The more you kind of get into some of these like little, like, uh, like sports injury related questions, it's, it, it, people get very frustrated sometimes. It's really not like a black and white answer, right? right? It's typically very gray. My first instinct is to say, no, not really. If you don't have any issues with your ankles, then you're probably not going to have issues with your ankles. But a lot of times, I mean, they can help with certain things like volleyball, especially if you're up at the net, like there's a pretty high risk of of coming down on someone's foot or just landing in, I mean, not really landing in an awkward position because that's called proprioception where your joint just knows where it's at in space. And uh, if you, depending on what level you're at, if you haven't rolled your ankle yet, you probably have pretty good ankle proprioceptive input. So you're not going to be in these more vulnerable positions. But if you're trying to be preventative, then sure, yeah, they'll help. They're not, no, here's the thing ankle braces, speaking of proprioception, ankle braces don't do anything to prevent an ankle sprain, right? Like if you're going to roll your ankle, you're rolling your ankle right. period. Like I've, I've rolled my ankle a thousand times while wearing ankle braces. Same. Um, I'm sure there's some of the listeners <laughs> out here who have uh-huh. themselves. It doesn't necessarily stop the roll. Now, the only time I've, I mean, that's, you know, there's always caveats right. to that, or there's always the exception. When I was playing football, I had an ankle brace that literally had metal steel plates. that went down the sides on both <sighs> sides. So no, my ankle wasn't going anywhere, but my mobility suffered because of that. And I doubt that's what you want as a volleyball player, but your classic ASO ankle brace that a lot of that a lot of volleyball players wear, that's not going to do a dang thing to stop your ankle from rolling. But what it is really good at is giving your ankle something called proprioceptive input. So allowing oh. your ankle to know where it's at in space a little bit better. So that's it's like kind a tactile of how it works. Cue. An ankle brace, it, it works not necessarily because it's stopping you from rolling your ankle. It works because it lets you know that you're about to roll your ankle. Yeah, kind of. It, it, it prevents you from getting in the position to roll your ankle to begin wow, that, with. Wow, <laughs> that's right? interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super cool. And that's how a lot of those braces work. Like, that's how, like, knee braces work, mm-hmm. too, to a degree. That's how tape works, you know. There's nothing special about K-tape. No, I don't have anything against K-tape. I use it a ton. But that kinesio tape, that's not doing a dang thing other than just providing some tactile cueing or some sensation and sensory awareness into uh-huh. these areas that may otherwise be lacking it. Wow. <laughs> Especially if you've already if you've rolled your ankles to begin with. But if you haven't rolled your ankles to begin with, then my first instinct is, of course, like I said earlier, I would say no. But then again, from a preventative standpoint, I can see some benefit there too. Wow. Question two, and I've already learned a ton. So I'm excited to keep going. Um, <laughs> and that was something that I thought I knew. So that's really, really cool. Yeah, it's super cool when you when you start looking at it. Yeah. Okay, moving on. So I did want to ask you some kind of bigger picture questions too. So you mentioned you played football. What other sports mm-hmm. did you play? So I played football, basketball. I ran track. Those are the big mm-hmm. three. You know, I dabbled a little bit in like soccer and baseball, but that's little kid stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> track and football were my two main sports. Well, and you're and really big into training as well. Like right now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. So yep. thinking back to your team days, maybe back in high school, mm-hmm. the question is what to do when a key player is injured in terms of team mental toughness and team resiliency. When a key player is injured, that's huge. That can be a, that can be a big blow. <laughs> I mean, if, uh, any of you guys are watching the uh, NBA finals right now, the Golden, Golden State Warriors are going through a little bit of that with KD, or Kevin Durant, and Klay Thompson being hurt. I would say you'd want to rally around the effort that that player put in to the team in terms of wherever you're at in the season, mm-hmm. right? Like That's the beauty of being in a team sport is – It's a team effort and you guys work together. You guys bust your butts all summer long. If it's in volleyball, all season Mm -hmm. long. And when somebody goes down, it doesn't matter if it's a key player or not, but it it just kind of hurts a little extra when it is a key player. But you all know how, how hard that is on that individual Mm -hmm. themselves. Cause you know how bad they want to be out there with the team and you know how bad, like how much that hard work means to that person mm-hmm. to be able to see the results of it so i'd rally around that if i was if i was going to be coaching a te- if i'm when i'm coaching team mm-hmm. sports or just being in a sport myself like trying to rally around those efforts and knowing that that person gave it their all to put you in that position to be a successful mm-hmm. team or to be as good as you can be 
And now you're going to go out and kind of thrive off that effort and off that, off those feelings. So it's kind of like player. playing with a bit of a higher purpose because you're kind of playing for that player. Not, you know, 100%. Obviously, you're always going out and competing, right. but it's like, oh, like I rolled my ankle like I mentioned earlier, really yeah. bad my junior year of volleyball. And that was a really good season for us. And I personally felt really supported by my teammates because everyone kind of made it like, it's okay. Like we're going to keep going, keep playing hard. But I think as a coach looking at it, I would almost want to go to maybe the player who's stepping into that role. Cause that's probably going to be a scary role. You might have people shifting around into position. Yeah. So I don't remember who filled my role um, that year. It's been a while, but if you have someone yeah. go down with an ankle injury that plays middle blocker, for example, you might be pulling an outside over and then other people are playing in position. So really just spending a lot of time making sure that everyone knows what's required of that position so that they can perform yeah. well and sort of make up for that injured player. And then making sure that to the best of their ability that you keep the injured player involved. So when I was injured I was shagging balls and keeping score and you know handing balls at practice when I could but also mm -hmm. icing a lot <laughs> and, and <laughs> resting a lot uh, trying to yeah. get back and get healthy for the season but I think it's important to just work on making sure that everyone knows what they're doing what their role is in case there is anyone that's moving around give them confidence give them your support and then make sure the injured player stays involved as well yeah, and yeah, exactly. And then just kind of feed off that. It, it's really like a, the next player up mentality. Mm -hmm. You got to recognize the efforts like I was kind of talking about or kind of rally around the player to a, to a point, but you got to let them know like you busted your butt just as much yeah. too. You're ready for the role. You're ready for the updated uh, or for the, like the increased responsibility, mm -hmm. whoever's going to be filling that in, whether it's a single person or a group of players and really just kind of have them play with chip on the shoulder. Like, all right, now's your moment. Take, yeah. take advantage of the opportunity. I mean, the amount of stories that can be told based <laughs> off star players that are like household names that got their start because of an injured well, player. And that's, um, like, I mean, I'll give you Tom Brady. That's a perfect mm -hmm. example, right? I mean, that was not volleyball related, but that's a big name. One of the best quarterbacks of all time. And he got his start because the person starting in front of him got hurt. And that is a great message to your players too. When the season is starting, maybe if someone's upset about not starting or not getting as much playing time as they would hope for, or just saying, you know, like keep training because you never know. You don't want to leave yeah. your players on and promise them playing time when they're probably not going to get it. But, you know, there's something to be said for training and being ready for that moment if it does come up. 100%. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's get back into physical therapy questions. So mm -hmm. someone wanted to know how to safely get back into high level playing after a few years of no sports at all. Ooh, <laughs> man, after a few years of no sports at all. I mean, I think there's a lot into that. Like, why aren't you playing sports anymore? Was life busy? Did you get hurt? Did you have a kid? So, you know, maybe you haven't slept <laughs> very well in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Have you had a bunch of increased stress? Have you changed schools? Like, there's a ton of things that go into right. that, right? But I think the the best way to answer that question is kind of like the same way I talk to people about coming back from an injury or about just trying to improve overall resilience, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Is you got to build something called tissue capacity. Okay. Right? All of our tissues have a capacity level. It'd be the same as like trying to go from not running at all to go out running a marathon. Like I don't care how good a shape you're in. If you haven't ran a marathon before or haven't ran, then your body's going to break right. down, period. Because your tissue level, your, your tissues can't handle the amount of load and the amount of stress that you're putting them in. Same thing for sports. If you hadn't been playing volleyball, if you're trying to get back into high level playing after years of no sports, like high level, and what do you mean by that exactly right. too? Like, are we talking club level? Are we talking like you're trying to make it back and then like a, a pro circuit of some sort? A, you're going to have to work on skill set and you're going to have to be humble and not be prideful That's in the worst. your capabilities. <laughs> yeah, That's right? It's super tough. I'm one of the most competitive guys out there and it is so hard for me to recognize when like I'm not good at right. something. And, uh, and to know, and even worse to know, like I used to be good mm -hmm, at this, you mm -hmm. know, if you start off as a Ferrari, but then you never drive it for four years, there's going to be things that happen. There's going to be maintenance that needs to be done. There's going to be rust you need to knock mm -hmm. off. And from a sports standpoint, you have to recognize that. And you're going to have to get back to the fundamentals and you have to be savagely good at the fundamentals before you can, before you can move on to, a, to an elite level. 
That's what you did to start off with. That's what you got to do again. And then for the same thing from a training perspective, you can't jump straight back into an elite level training program. If you haven't been training for four or five, how many, how many years is a few years? Like, it's just not going to happen. Now you may be able to advance a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because that muscle memory is there, you know, those motor patterns have been developed over years than somebody who's like, you know, just starting off from square one. But you got to respect the fact that you were at an elite level at some point and you're not there anymore, but you have the capability of getting back there. So the best place to start would be at the fundamentals and then just progressing from there and building off those. It's, it's just like, you know, if you're trying to build a house on a weak foundation, it's going to topple over in the first storm that comes. And same thing with sports, same thing with training, same thing with the strength and conditioning, being savagely good at the simple things and then progressing from there. Awesome. And I love too, that there's like a little bit of a mental aspect too. Like you just got to suck it up. <laughs> you got to just realize yeah. that you're not going to be able to start at 100 right away and work your way up. And you should respect that fact. Like, heck man, I would not want to, it would, it would kind of stink if somebody could take four years off of a sport and then be able to jump right back into the level they were. Yeah. It, it almost kind of downplays how t- difficult it was for you to get there in the first That's place. Excellent you know? point. <laughs> that is a very, very <laughs> like, good point. If you haven't been in it for four years, like like I said, you can get there faster than probably when you got there before, but you got to respect the fact that you took time off. And again, that all depends too, like four years if we're going from 28 to 32, because then that's a big difference. Right. Um, unfortunately, just the uh, father time gets yes. involved. But, but that's what I would say. Start at the basics, get savagely good at it, and then progress from that. Savagely good. Love it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Next question, which it's another one of those things where I think I know the answer, like the ankle braces, but maybe you'll surprise me. I don't know. The question that we got is, should you stretch before doing anything or warm up a bit, then stretch? Should you stretch before doing anything? So as soon as you well, get to practice, putting, <laughs> putting, putting your shoes on, hopefully knee pads first, then shoes on, and then just going straight into stretches. So I'll answer this two ways. If I'm a player, and I've got, and I know that I have a mobility issue, or I know that I'm working through some type of, uh, I know like my hip flexors are tight, or I know I got tight calves, or I know that my hamstrings mm-hmm. are actually tight. Then yeah, get there a little early and be an athlete and work on your body, right? But if I'm a coach, then no, I'm not wasting my time programming static stretching into my warm ups. It's wasting your time, it's wasting your athlete's time. And a matter of fact, research has shown that static, like long static hold stretching, will actually decrease your performance. If I'm going to be doing static stretching, if I'm going to do it at all, it's going to be afterwards okay. while I'm doing some type of after a practice or after a workout or after conditioning, I'm going to be doing some static stretching, working into some of these bigger end ranges, improving my athlete's mobility. And, and then I'm also probably going to be working on some breath work when I go through that as well, because breathing is super important. <laughs> that could be a whole <laughs> podcast in and of itself yes. right there. And if you haven't heard of uh, The Art of Breath by Brian McKenzie, that's an excellent course for you coaches out there. I'd totally recommend that. I, don't get, I have no financial connection with those guys. They're just super smart and they know what they're doing. And it would be of super good value for y'all. Um, I will find a link but, and I will include it. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool stuff. That's a long answer to say if I'm an athlete and I know I have some tissue restrictions, yeah, or some mobility issues, yeah, I'm going to get there early before practice, like before like legit practice starts and we're getting into our warmups and everything. And I'm going to be working on my own self-maintenance, my self-body care. If you're an athlete, you have to do that. And if you're not, you're shortchanging yourself. So if we um, as coaches have an athlete that maybe does have some restrictions, we just need to tell them, you know, get here early, stretch this out, and then you'll be ready to jump in with the team. It kind of ties into the next question as well. So we'll, we can kind of combine them. Uh, but the next question yeah. is that they do dynamic stretching at the beginning of practice and static stretching at the end. Would you recommend just starting out with dynamic stretching or would you do like a warm up game where you have your athletes play a little bit, but not go all out or which should they do first? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would do both. So like, here's the thing, your warm ups don't have to be take an hour long. I actually go around um, and, and, and present on this at different gyms too. When you're talking about, an adult training program, like as adults, you get busy and as kids, you, you're probably even busier, honestly, with some of these schedules that mm-hmm. kids that these youth athletes have now, but you know, you get an hour and you're trying to get through as much as you can with some of these programmings and like your warm ups don't need to be anything super mm-hmm. extensive. So don't feel like you got to get overwhelmed by like, I have to have the perfect warm up. What you want to do is you want to get your core temperature up. You want to work in big range of motions and you want to start working into some of these more sports specific movements that you're going to be doing for that day. And so that when your athletes are ready to go, they're ready to rock. They're, they're mm-hmm. warmed up. They're a little sweaty. They're breathing heavy. They're neurologically prepped, primed, ready to go. 
and uh, you're going to get the most out of that practice session because you're not going to be starting off super sluggish and, and trying to wake people up. I love to throw in some type of mental component to my warmups, especially if I'm working with athletes. Okay. So, you know, say for your warmups, you have people doing some type of like jog back and forth or sprint back and forth or side shuffles or whatever right, it right. may be. I'm going to have, I'm going to do something where I'm like, all right, I'm going to go when the math problem equals an even number, oh. right? Instead of just, all right, and go or hit the whistle or whatever. Like, I'll be like, you know, I'm really bad at math. So my math is normally pretty simple, yeah. but I'm like, all right, you know, and two plus one, two plus two. So then they have to go, they have to think about it and then they have to, and then react. And so uh, they're waking up their central nervous system a little bit more. Um, they're getting, a, they're kind of shaking the fog or the rust off their busy day. And they're kind of getting ready to, ready yeah, to actually focus on from a logic and exactly. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. I love that. My math's not great either. Yeah. So I'll have to, <laughs> I think I can handle basic yeah, addition, was, but <laughs> Or it could be off of like, you know, go when I say a state instead of a city, which is even harder actually. But then, or like go when I say when the, you know, the object is a blue, uh, the color of the object is blue or, you know, just something where they're getting, where they have to think. I, that makes it fun. React, and just, also I enjoy making my players laugh or attempting to anyway. So that seems like something, especially younger kids, they would have fun with that. <laughs> oh yeah. Younger kids. And I'll tell you what, I man, my adults would love that too. It's, uh, <laughs> It's fun, especially with the math. That's when uh, that's when pride. Gets yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's always a fun one. Trying to see the the, the uh, gears get grinding when uh, we're doing some math problems. <laughs> Love it. So <laughs> since we kind of were talking about, I was thinking little kids would like that. You said you work with adults. Someone else did ask, "What age do you start training your athletes?" What ages are training athletes from a strength yeah, standpoint? Yeah, let's say, actually, there was another question here. Someone asked about starting training for your athletes, and then how do I introduce 12s and 13s, so 12 and 13-year-olds, to strength training mm -hmm. with something like lightweight med balls and dumbbells? Great questions. Those are heavily debated in the world of strength and mm -hmm. conditioning. But, I mean, right now, I mean – what you're trying to do when you're working with a younger kid, especially around the ages of 12, is look, these kids barely know how to move their own freaking bodies, <laughs> let alone you don't want to load them up. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure you, everyone walk, all these kids are walking around like baby giraffes. Like, they have no idea how to control their body. Um, and that's, and so what you want to do is you want to get these, you want to get these athletes prepped up and, and ready to go and to get good movement patterns in so that when they do start, they don't even have the hormones to, to get stronger yet. <laughs> Typically, uh -huh. you know, there's always the exceptions to the rule, but your typical 12 to 13 year old isn't even going to really benefit all that much from like trying to do traditional, like l linear progression strength training. Uh -huh. Right now you can always get into the debate of biological age versus like numerical age or whatever. Right. Sure. But overall, what you want to do when you're working with youth athletes is you want to get them moving super efficiently, teach them how a squat should look. And if you want to put a PVC pipe or you want to put like some super lightweight on there, fine, go for it. But they better be moving really mm -hmm. well. And then, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you definitely want to be improving movement patterns. Before I load an athlete up with a bar or like a 12 year old athlete up with a barbell across their back, I probably would have them do, okay, you look really good with your, your squats look really good. Now let's go to single leg. Let's see, we, let's see, uh, can we control our body now that we're on, we're with one mm -hmm. leg, right? And then, cause that's going to be a whole different uh, demand on the body. Uh -huh. And that's going to be something that's going to be really tough. And you can make these body weight movements as hard as you want. Now, you don't have to stay at body weight by any means, but you definitely want to I would, focus on form. I would argue you focus on form, focus on body control, focus on sports specific um, movements and, and, and just being able to move well, because once these athletes move well, and now once they start picking up the weight, they, you know, you give them a couple more years and, and they're starting to actually have some of these hormones that allow them to get stronger. Mm -hmm. Boom. Now, now, not only do you have reduced injury risk for your athletes, but now you're go they're going to get a way better benefit. They're going to get stronger way faster, and they're not going to develop poor movement patterns that develop or carry on with them all the way until they get to a collegiate program where they see me in the clinic, and we got to change up a bunch of things. <laughs> oh, no. So the main thing then is just to focus on, well, sports-specific movement, so making sure that they understand how to control their body. Mm -hmm. Learning how to do the movements for like squats or what have you correctly. Squats, push ups, uh, how to jump, how to land. Um, I know there's some questions coming up about how to jump, Lots. but um, <laughs> yeah, how to how does how to squat down on a single leg? How to how to run appropriately? I know this is like a super vague answer to this, and and you know if somebody wants to shoot me an email, I'll give my contact information out at the end of this. Feel free to reach out to me. I have no issue mm -hmm. with that. 
and we can dive into it a little bit more. But again, this kind of goes back to what I said earlier, being savagely simple at the basics. And the basics are being able to move your body and have control and know what your body's doing in certain positions, period. Period. Love it. (laughs) Another great answer. (laughs) Okay. Let's see. Let's talk about, this is a question from an athlete. So I do get a lot of questions from athletes and I really like addressing these because I think a lot of the coaches listening could benefit from knowing kind of what they're putting in their athlete's head. And so this question was, how do you discuss injury with your coach without it coming off as an excuse? Mm. Yeah. First of all, I'll say this. This shouldn't be a question. Right. Like if right. you're, if you, if, listen, if you're a coach, you should never have a barrier put up to where your, your player's afraid to come to you and tell you how they feel, whether it's emotionally, physically, spiritually, I guess, like anything, mm-hmm. like you shouldn't have those kind of barriers up. Like you don't have to be your player's best friend, but you're at a minimum a mentor to them, or you should be, or you're not doing your job very well. And people aren't afraid to talk to their mentors. That's why they're mm-hmm. mentors. And that's part of the job of being a coach. Anyway, I'll get off that soapbox because <laughs> that's okay. I might <laughs> add some more later. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause like, here, and here's why I say this is I was in the exact same boat when I was in high school. I played sports growing up three season athlete, like my entire life, my freshman year, I injured my knee. I had two knee surgeries and then I tore my quad. I had wrist surgery. So I missed my sophomore, my junior year sports. Devastating. Devastated. And um, I go back my senior year and, you know, I I get wound up in a tackle and a simplistic word, I I blow out the outside of my Mm -hmm. head, right? Like, um, tore all three ligaments out on the outside of my ankle, had like nerve damage, um, fractures. But I wanted to play so bad, I didn't say a word to my coaches. And then, uh, when my coaches did find out, they tried, they brought me into their office and they started like reaming me, telling me that like the medical world's a business and that I'm not really hurt or I'm not really what? injured. And just like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, and you don't want to be that coach, period. Come on, know your roles, know your That's lanes. And, and, and same thing, we, we as healthcare professionals have the same conversations. Like, I'm not going to go out there and I'm not going to do volleyball specific drills with people because that's not my lane. Mm-hmm. That's not what I'm going to do. It's not what I'm good at. It's not what, I, and if I try to, I'll be doing a disservice to whoever I'm working with. Mm-hmm. And you as the coach should, be, is, should have that exact same mindset. Like, it's not your job to, to decide if somebody's injured or if they're faking. Right. It. Um, and that's why I have you that's, that's answering a, these questions instead of trying to answer them myself because your background <laughs> right, is exactly, yeah. trained. You've trained extensively you do it every day that's why you're answering these questions yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah we know our lanes and, and we and we stay within those mm-hmm. lanes now there's gray lines for sure right. like um i talk to coaches a lot like you know you're kind of like the the emt of the sport injury world to almost to a degree mm-hmm. like you know <laughs> your true. first your first line right. if you're an athlete though and you have those reservations honestly you don't have you don't have to go to your coach about an injury until you go and you see a medical provider mm-hmm. That we, if you're legitimately worried about your coach thinking that you're faking an injury, mm-hmm. just bypass that coach. Right. Like you don't have to go to that coach. It doesn't sound like there's a good relationship there to begin with. I would go to a medical provider. <laughs> My own biased opinion. Right. Um, I would go find a a performance based physical therapist who works with athletes on a daily basis. Don't go to your typical run of the mill PT clinic who works with grandma and grandpa and helps them get back from knee surgeries. Nothing to, or gets them back from total knees and helps them stand up. But from someone the couch. that like, works nothing with wrong athletes. With that. On a regular basis. Yes, because they know uh, they're going to be able to have a little bit of a different skill set that's going to allow them to better diagnose and help you with that, help you navigate through your injury. And so that's going to be looking They'll... for performance based physical therapists. Is like, how would you search for that? Yeah. So there's a really good group called Clinical Athlete. They've got a almost like a search engine for people in your area. That'd be the first place I would go. And then unfortunately from there, it's just going to be like uh, word of mouth. You can reach out to me again. And if you're in a certain area, like we know a lot of people in a lot of different parts of the country, we can definitely try to help you out. But clinical athlete would be the first place I would go for sure. To put it simple, go to a medical provider, figure out what's going on, figure out a game plan and let your coach know. And if they have an issue with that, then there's, I mean, there's, there's legal things that can happen at that point. But I mean, if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, but um, well, let's also, let me say too, from the athlete perspective, If you have a coach who is doubting an injury, it's probably because you've been behaving in a way that causes the coach to doubt you. That's not for sure, Mm -hmm. but I know I have had a couple players in the past who time to run sprints and suddenly they're not feeling well 
but you know, they're, they're yeah. saying that their ankles bothering them. But then when it's time to play a fun game, that's when they want to jump in. So I'll let them sit out mm. and then they'll jump back yeah. in. <laughs> you said this was hurting, but you're literally doing the same yeah. movements now. It's just fun. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good point. If you're hurt, you're hurt. I mean, that's a, that's a great point. If you're hurt, you're hurt sit out the only way that you can get better essentially is by giving yourself some rest Mm -hmm. and making sure that you are actually okay to continue but make sure that you're conducting yourself in a way at practice that shows you know you are dedicated to the sport a little bit of a preventative uh work there on the athlete's part but always be going hard in practice and but you know if that hasn't been you If you haven't been going hard and your coach is doubting you just because you feel that they are maybe questioning whether you're hurt or not, don't let that change your opinion. I know another personal story, but when I rolled my ankle, my weightlifting coach, my PE teacher, everyone was saying like, oh, you're fine. Just ice it. Get back on the court. You know, you're being a wuss. And I, I was on crutches. I needed my crutches. I knew it was hurt. And I ended up going back to the doctor and there was a hairline fracture, which they didn't catch the first time. And I remember them saying, yeah. oh, thank goodness you weren't using this. You could have done some serious damage to it. When, when yeah. in reality, everyone had been pushing me to get back on the court because they thought I was faking it. And trust me, I was a hard yeah. worker, but everyone just yeah. thought I was faking it and being a wuss. And so, yep. We can move on to the next question, but make sure you're putting in work as an athlete. If you're hurt, you're hurt. Don't try and pick and choose when to come back on the court. Just let yourself rest um, and find, I'll include that resource that you mentioned, Jacob. Yeah, clinical athlete. And then Mm -hmm. uh, get yourself some help. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, you got to put forth the effort. You have to have a good relationship with your coach and then seek the appropriate medical help. Perfect. Okay. Quick break, though. Do you want to just let us know a little bit about yourself, like who you work with, where you're located, and what you do? Yeah, I'd love to. So, um, so my name is Dr. Jacob Swear. For all you guys who don't know, mm-hmm. or who missed the intro, or fast forwarded through it like <laughs> I do, um, when I listen to I the do podcast. That too. And right, <laughs> yeah. So my background, I, I got my undergraduate degree in exercise science. I've always been interested in enhancing human performance. That's been a passion of mine ever since. I mean, I guess high school, uh, since I've been dealing with injuries and have to improve it myself. But after college, I did about a six month long internship with a like an athlete performance enhancement center. And um, so like, you know, working with youth athletes, um, collegiate athletes, some pro athletes in terms of improving human performance, sport performance, and then uh, just noticing that there's a little bit of a gap there in my skill set and what I wanted to be able to do for people. Went off to PT school where I got my doctorate degree in physical therapy and then was able to combine my skill set of strength and conditioning and physical therapy to land me into a position where I'm at now, where I work with a performance-based physical therapy clinic in Atlanta, Georgia, the company named Athletes Potential, where we work with active adults in the Atlanta area. We work with athletes of any age. I think the youngest person I have on my caseload so far um, down there has been like 11 years old or something like that. All the way up to Olympic level athletes. We've got a couple of Olympic lifters (laughs) on our... uh, on our caseload, we have pro NFL players, you know, volleyball players of all different ages. And it's a ton of fun. We get to work with people who are really interested in improving themselves versus people who don't really want to be there. And on top of that, I'm also a strength coach for a training facility here. The name of the gym is called Stat Wellness. So I really try to keep one foot in that arena as well because coaching is a passion of mine. It's what I really enjoy doing. Um, coaching being from a strength coach perspective. And yeah. That's where I'm at. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Love it. And he is really good at stat wellness. I was just there and I took a class with him and I wasn't sore for days, but I definitely knew I got a good workout. In. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. The goal, the goal is to make you get just that, get a good workout, but then not feel like you can't walk for 10 days and that workout. It, it was a good feeling. So thank you, <laughs> Jacob, for that excellent workout. It was, it was really What nice. I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So you did mention training some volleyball players. And so mm-hmm. the next question that we have is about specifically strength training exercises for liberos. Do you have any insight into that? <laughs> Heck yeah. So I actually got to work with some pretty elite level uh, collegiate liberos just this past summer. I, I tell you what, for a libero, you got to have first step quickness, period. 
Um, you got to be able to re- have a high reactability uh, skill set. Um, you got to be able to have just be have a quick lateral step. So if I'm going to be training liberos specifically, or if I'm working with liberos specifically, that's where a lot of my focus is going to be on. All right, how quickly can we get that first step? Because with volleyball, I mean, especially libero, mm-hmm. you got to be able to react quick. Like you're you're the first line of defense essentially, and you got to be able to set it up right. So. I'm going to be working on single leg strength, lateral strength. Um, and by lateral, I mean side to side. I'm going to be doing different plyometric drills to help develop that power and that quickness as well. Agility drills that, again, get you lateral, get, get you kind of diagonal. Because very rarely, I hope you're not like backing up too much as a libero. You shouldn't be doing that. Mm-hmm. But that definitely that, that step forward and to the side is what I'm going to be working on a ton. With. So I heard you say plyos. And anytime I hear plyos, I just think front row. So liberos need to be doing plyos as well. Heck yeah, <laughs> liberos need to be doing plyos. Um, and listen, like I think people don't fully understand what plyometrics are. Plyometrics are meant to deliver or meant to make you powerful. Period. Um, they are meant to. They're not meant to be. How many box jumps can you get in a minute? Like they're not meant to get you super sweaty. They're not meant to make you breathe really hard. They're meant for you to deliver max level effort every single rep. And if you can't deliver a max level effort on a certain set or a certain rep, then you need to back off or you need to give yourself bigger rest. Like these, these are movements that should be very powerful, very quick, max effort every single time. I would be doing that. And there's a ton of different things. Like it's just not jumping uh, in terms of like just straight up and down. Like I'd be getting them, I'd be doing a uh, single leg jump. I'd be getting people lateral, a really good drill. would be doing some form of lateral bound with a stick type movement. Again, we're working on a uh, single leg control where you start off on say your left leg, you're going to jump over onto your right and you're going to land on your right leg. And you're going to hold that landing until you're nice and control and, and you own that position and then, again, repeat to the next side. But, yeah, I mean, that's just a simple example. I'd be doing some type of crossover movement as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's, a bunch, there's a bunch of things. I'd be getting the volleyball involved. Uh, but, yeah, definitely plyometric drills in terms of getting side to side. Uh, not necessarily straight up and down and jumping because that's not necessarily mm-hmm. a libero skill set. Right. But working on that side to side quickness is what I'd be doing. Love it. Awesome. Okay. The next question Single sport versus multi-sport. Which mm-hmm. is better for kids to stay healthy and prevent injury? Multi-sport. Next question. <laughs> no, no, it's, that's a, that's a no-brainer. Uh, easy. I mean, the research you can't argue with it. It's multi-sport. You look at like, man, what was this crazy stat that I saw? Like, I mean, it's it's all over. You, you just Google it and you'll find it. But the amount of athletes that Urban Meyer, who's arguably the one of the best. I'm a little biased because I am a Buckeye, yeah. but um, <laughs> arguably one of the best coaches in collegiate history. And not just from a coaching standpoint, but from a recruiting standpoint, it blew anything else out of the water in terms of how many athletes he got that were multi-sport athletes versus single sport athletes. I remember you telling me this. I feel like it was like five that were single sport. And then it's everyone... a ridiculously low number. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah everyone else it, is multi-sport. Yeah. Because, I mean, you think about it, A, you're moving at a bunch of different movement planes. So if you play volleyball and all you do is play volleyball, you're going to be doing the exact same movement patterns over and 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 over again. Mm-hmm. But you do something like, all right, you take a volleyball player, and now let's go run track in the springtime. Now you talk, talk about a volleyball player who may be doing high jump and maybe learning how to get a better foot position on how to jump higher, right? Mm-hmm. Or Got how it. to control their body a little bit better. Or you take a volleyball player and now they go play soccer. Now, man, their lateral quickness and their just overall endurance and the, is so much stronger. Um, and it's preventing it injury as well. Yes, and preventing injury. And something else that's really cool that people don't really think about is just creativity and sport and movement. Because think about it this way. Say you're an athlete and since the age of 10, all you've done is played volleyball. That's it. All okay. year round, volleyball. Mm-hmm. That's immediately where your mind goes in any certain situation. Is just like how would a volleyball player handle this, right? And then you go and you turn to a multi-sport athlete who's who's a stud of volleyball, but then is also is a track star too. Now they are like, how, all right, how would an athlete handle this position versus, versus volleyball or player. handle this situation? Your athlete, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like you just get create more, a little bit more creativity in your movements. I mean, you see, you can, you can see the transition happen. A good example is uh, basketball players, mm-hmm. collegiate basketball players who can't make it into the NBA. And then they go and they dominate in the NFL because they have a certain skill set of like boxing out that, that they're really good at for like catching passes in the end zone. So like they develop a certain skill set and they take that creativity to a uh-huh. different sport and dominates the position. Same thing can happen in any sport. You could take like I was just talking about with high mm-hmm. jump with and track and applying those to volleyball. If you think that if you get really good at high jump and track, guess what? You're going to be able to jump through the roof when you get inside a get into a court. You're going to be a lot better at it. Probably more probably better than anybody else you're going up against. So I think it's um, mental yeah. too um as far as 
burnout. I had a yeah, the mental fatigue. Yeah. Oh my gosh, um, yeah. Because I got sick of volleyball when I was, I think, my sophomore year of high school. I just like I didn't want to play anymore. It's refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> it's refreshing it's nice to, to take go a break. Like... And um, actually, Heck volleyball yeah. now has become year round with. Um, a longer club season for most players and earlier training camps. And now beach volleyball is gaining in popularity, which I actually think beach is a nice break from indoor while still getting to play volleyball mentally anyway. But I think Mm -hmm. there's a lot to be said for taking a break and playing a different sport and just not having the stress of constant volleyball. (laughs) Gosh, I totally agree. I think about any of the sports I played and I love sports (laughs) sports <laughs> yes. but i would get sick and tired of all of them by the end of the season yeah. you know yes. it's it. and and then miss and then miss the heck out of them when when it's when the season's yeah right and it the makes quarter, it so much right? better to go and back and be ready to rock yeah yeah <laughs> i totally agree i mean that's a long-winded answer to simple answer being yeah multi-sport, multi-sport. no Hands doubt down. no brainer if you have a, if you have a kid who's a really good volleyball player the worst thing you can do for that kid is make him play volleyball all the time Okay, let's go ahead and jump to, no pun intended, besides box <laughs> jumps, what are some exercises to help with a vertical? This is a question that everyone wants to know, Jacob. How do you get a better vertical? Yes. How do you get a better vertical? <laughs> I mean, I hate to make all these answers sound like really simple at the start, but get stronger, right? All right. <laughs> um, you, you, you have to be strong to jump high. This is a whole rabbit hole that we could go down into for a very let's long keep time. it surface but, level surface um, level simple other than box jumps box jumps is a good place to start but man I, the amount of athletes who don't have good control over their body who are then trying to jump very high and at a max level effort you can see the disconnect there um actually i was just working on this the other day with a youth athlete in the clinic the first thing i would do if i'm going to try to improve jumping with somebody is i'm going to see how well they can land from that jump how well can they absorb load because our bodies are pretty smart. They're typically not going to let us produce more force than it feels mm-hmm. like it can handle, than it can absorb. This actually comes from when I was out in Colorado Springs at a symposium at the National Strength and Conditioning Association's headquarters. We we're talking about how to improve a volleyball player's serving mm-hmm. speed. Like a bunch of coaches were wanting, all right, or like, uh, you know, coaches and then like high school strength coaches or whatever. All right, so, uh, you know, we're going to work on anterior shoulder strength or the front of our shoulder. We're going to work on strengthening that up, our chest our internal rotators. And I remember I was, I was still like just a little, just a little baby in the world of strength conditioning. I was a freshman. It was after my uh-huh. freshman year of college and my mind was just blown by this and I'll never forget it. But the guy's like, no, he's like strengthen their back. <laughs> and I was like, what? Their back. And uh, he's like, your body will not let you produce more force. And it feels like it can control. So the stronger your antagonist muscle group is, the more force you're going to be able to produce because you're going to be you're essentially going to take the governor off your body because it knows it can control it so it's the same thing with jumping like can you control good can you control landings well you better be able to Mm -hmm. even if that's not the case and you're and you and you can jump really high but you land like crap then you're setting yourself up for injury so landing well is step (laughs) okay and that's where you're going to do things like drop squats you're going to do things like uh, depth jumps you're going to you're going to be working on that load absorption. Now, to then go forward and get higher jumping capabilities, A, I want you to be stronger, Mm -hmm. period. The stronger you are, the more you're going to be able to jump. So by strength, I don't mean always just squats, (laughs) right? Like Bulgarian split split squats are going to be a really good thing to do. Lunges are going to be a really good thing to do. Step-ups are going to be a really good thing to do. Just anything that's going to help develop lower leg strength. But then you you got to Take that strength and you got to apply power to it, right? And once you start applying power to it, power is quickness. So things like hang clings. I think that one of the best movements you can do for an athlete is teach them how to do a hang cling and go from there. Like that's a, that's a very powerful movement that crosses over very well to just about any sport. But I'm going to be hitting a ton of mm-hmm. plyometric drills. And again, that's there's books <laughs> worth of drills for that. Perfect. <laughs> so, I mean, I won't, I won't dive into it too much. If you want more information, again, hit me up. But I'm going to be doing a ton of plyometric drills where we're, got, we're not just doing box jumps. We're going to be doing broad jumps. You know, we're trying to get, going to get, try to get powerful horizontally. Again, just trying to get powerful hips. The more powerful and snappy our hips are, the better you're going to be able to produce force and the better you're going to be able to get vertical once you change the direction that you're applying that force. I mean, depending on the skill level or or the training level of the athlete, something that I love to do to improve not just vertical jump, but also speed as well is something called complex sets, where essentially you are doing something. We'll Mm -hmm. take deadlifts, for example. By the way, (laughs) got to do deadlifts. (laughs) That's going to be awesome for you. 
say you take something like a deadlift, right? And then you're going to hit, we'll say five to eight reps at like 85% of your one rep max. And then you're going to immediately drop off from that. And you're going to go do something like pogo hops, or you're going to do pogo like, hops? Um, you're going to do, <laughs> yeah, it's, essentially it's where you just stand there and you, and you try to jump up in the air as, as hard as you freaking can without, but with like minimal interesting, defense, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. Or you're going to do something like, uh, you're going to do something like box jumps or you're going to do something like broad jumps, or you're going to do something like single mm-hmm. leg box jumps. But you're essentially what you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to prep up. You're like, do some neural priming with that sub maximal, but still a high, high effort lift with like, you know, a compound movement, like a deadlift or a squat. And then you're going to go immediately apply that uh, neural priming to uh, a powerful movement, like a box jump or a broad jump or a pogo jump. And that has a lot of evidence to suggest that it is a very effective way at improving people's vertical jump skills. So get stronger and then apply that strength in a powerful way with various different And learn how to land and strengthen your back so that your body knows it's in control of itself and allows you to use that strength. Well, yeah, the back thing was more for well, uh, yeah, I serving. Guess I, but that was when just I think of vertical, example, I, I think we're going into the swing, um, going into an attack. Oh, yeah. So I guess that's not always the case. Yeah. We're sometimes uh, like jump setting and blocking and um, doing things like that. But yeah. Yeah, I'm a little sure. ahead I mean, of like, myself. Yeah, if you want to start getting like real volleyball specific. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're, you're applying a couple different yes. methods on <laughs> one. But, but yeah, if you want to hit harder. Get a better, get a stronger. Um, well, let's go ahead and jump to that question because someone asked, yeah. "How do you get back muscles, and what muscles are most needed for hitters?" So we already talked about vertical. We can skip that. I've got notes upon notes mm-hmm. upon notes now about what to do. Yeah. So how do we yeah. get those back muscles? How do you get those back muscles? More? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's so simple. Um, it's so simple. No, and it should be like, all right, I'll get to that okay. question here in a second. How to strengthen your back? But like. Guys, with with your strengthening and and with your training protocols, like I had a, I was actually listening to this other podcast called I think it's called Just Fly. They were talking. They had a guest on there who's who's a very well known strength coach, and you know, and he's made a living and he he's made a, a very strong reputation for himself off of strength training. And at the end of the day, he said like you know, getting strong is like falling off a boat and hitting water. Getting strong shouldn't be this really complex convoluted issue that we make for it the simpleness of strength training is what is so appealing to it in my opinion yeah how to make your back stronger so you're going to want to do things like we're talking about upper backs one of my favorite upper back strength drills is going to be a bent over row or a penley row those are going to be getting a barbell in your hand and getting both sides of your back to work together is going to be a great place to start then i want to do um i'm going to do bent over rows with the single with the dumbbell i'm going to train my body and how to work unilaterally or one side versus the other so your back is really good for pulling not necessarily pushing mm-hmm. right so any drill that you can do in the gym that's going to improve pulling and when you pull for your back you want to do both horizontal and vertical pulls so bent over rows like i talked about and you can get all you can get face pulls you can get really there's a ton of different horizontal pulls that you can do with that. That's what I mean when I say that. And then vertical pulls are going to be things like your pull-ups. Mm-hmm. They're going to be things like lat pull-downs. They're going to be things like straight-on lat pull-downs. They're going to be anything that's going to really be really engaging your lat muscles mm-hmm. in particular. But your lats and your scapular retractors, those are going to be two big back muscles that you're going to want to focus on. And then don't forget about your spinal erectors too. Those are going to get really strong with things like in particular, deadlifts. <laughs> I can't tell you the amount of like power lifters that I work with who have these massive spinal erectors. That's the muscle that goes right along uh-huh. the sides, each side of your spinal column. That's an awesome lift to do for that. And there's a bunch of other ones. But if I had to choose one exercise to do for my back, if I had to choose one exercise to do for my back, it would be probably deadlifts. deadlifts. <laughs> if I had to choose my top three favorite drills for strengthening your back, deadlift. And then I'd probably have to go with bent over row and pull-ups. I like that you're giving us specific, do this, do this, do this. But if you're not able to do that, you can do this. I just love the specifics, but also the general is good. Just lift more. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, don't get so far down into the weeds that you get frustrated and you get a little paralysis by analysis, right? If you want to get your back stronger, pull more weight, period. Get more volume in, get more time under tension in. Simple. Don't Um, overthink it. Yeah, exactly. Don't get too, too caught up with it, with it. But at the same time, there are better things. Don't go to your favorite Instagram influencer and find the coolest looking exercise that they're doing 
and 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 always right. at that <laughs> um, because you're not gonna you're probably not gonna get very far with that. And half of and, those are made for views um, anyway, not and, because they're beneficial. It's just because it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, they're they're made because they look cool. And you know how they in honestly, you know how they got to that to the point where they can handle those type of positions and do things that look cool. They got savagely good at the basics. <laughs> so they did the things like the pull-ups and mm-hmm. the rows and the deadlifts and everything else to get nice and strong so that then they can go and do a, some weird looking <laughs> handstand <laughs> on a med ball with a kettlebell swing Caribbean. or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's uh okay. <laughs> don't do that. Vertical pool, horizontal pools. You can basically break it up into those two movements and your back's going to get nice and strong and then throw on some deadlifts. Awesome. I want to respect your time. So I'm going to cut down the questions a little bit. We can do like two or three more. I know that there was a bunch of really good questions. Any ones that you see on the list that you specifically are wanting to answer? Um, what important thing female athletes should do to prevent injury? This is a really big one because actually female athletes are at a much higher risk than male athletes at 10. Really? ACL. They are. Yep. Uh, like a significant amount. I, I mean, don't quote me on the number, but I think it's something as high as like 60%. What? Higher. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an absurd amount. And there's a lot of things that go into that, like your Q angle and like different hormone things. But one of the things that you can do is get your lateral hip nice and strong. So by lateral hip, I mean outside hip. So whenever you're looking at an athlete and you see their knee kind of cave in when they land or cave in when they jump, you want them to have better la- outside hip control. So things like single leg movements are going to be really good. There's a type of training called R and T training. So literally the letters R in Okay. T R N T training, where essentially what you're going to do is you're going to have them get into a rear foot elevated split squat position. And then you're going to take a band and you're going to pull that band so that their knees going to, it would collapse their knee in and they got to resist that band and pull out. That's a really good drill to do to help prevent some of these knee positions that can lead to ACL tears. So outside hip strength is really important. That'd be my first thing. And the most important thing females should do to prevent injury is lateral hip strength. Okay, so someone else wanted to know how to become a physiotherapist in Canada. So I know uh, you go by physical therapist, physiotherapist. Are they the same? Are they different? Also, I know you're not in Canada, so I don't know how much information you have on that. But tell us about how you got to where you are. Yeah, I mean, physio, physical therapist are the exact same terms. Here in the States, you have to go to an accredited PT program. You have to get your doctorate degree. So that's, you know, seven total years of training, four years of undergrad, three years of grad school. And then you have to take a national board exam. So that's how you become one here in the States. I'm assuming this process is similar in Canada, but... I am not Canadian, <laughs> but I am rooting for the Raptors in the, in the NBA. Finals. Oh, you'll have a lot but, of uh, um, fans from this end. There's a lot of Canadian get the pancake fans. So. Nice. <laughs> please, please, Kawhi Leonard, let, let's go, man. I want to see these Warriors get taken down. Bye. So yeah. last user submitted question. They said, my daughter complains of her feet being sore even after replacing her shoes. What's up with that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the old shoe. Um, so if your daughter's feet still hurt, then what I'd recommend, again, like I kind of recommended earlier, is I'd recommend going and seeing a good performance physical therapist um, who works with athletes. But in terms of shoes, I wouldn't get too worked up about the shoes being an issue because there was actually a really interesting study by the military where they took a huge number of people and they essentially split them up into two different sections. The first group, they were able to go pick out whatever shoe they wanted. Just pick out a shoe that feels comfortable, right? And then the next group, they went to some shoe specialist that really kind of looked at like, oh, the pronation or the supination of your feet. Um, Well, you see you have a very long longitudinal arch here. So we're going to put you in this specific shoe type. We're going to get this video analysis of you running. Ah, see, you have a little bit too much of a supinatory twist here. So we're going to get you here so you don't roll your ankle. And then they went down that rabbit hole and they got a very a very specific shoe to mm-hmm. them. And then they come and they check back like a year later. And guess what? Injury rates and performance are the exact same. There's what? no difference between the two. <laughs> yeah, crazy, right? That's so not what I was expecting. Don't go... <laughs> So I don't put people in inserts for that for for a very similar reason, but I wouldn't get too worked up on, oh man, it must be the shoe. You know, sure, give it a try, see if it helps. That's a very uh low hanging fruit piece of uh a, a piece of low hanging fruit that you can that you can do that might make a difference. Mm-hmm. But if your daughter's feet are still hurting, there's a literally endless amount of things that could be causing your daughter's feet to still hurt, and you'd want to go get a trained eye on that. So again, just looking up a performance physical therapist. Is that the same thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, performance-based physical therapy. Yeah, or just, or, you know, just somebody who specializes in working with youth athletes. Perfect. 
for athletes in general. Yeah. Awesome. So I did want to ask you one final thing, just see if there's anything that came up through our conversation or, you know, since you've been thinking volleyball, if there's anything, any advice that you've thought of that maybe you didn't get to expand on or that you Mm -hmm. want to add before we let you go. You guys all ask really good questions and I appreciate you bringing me on and, and and your guys' interest in being preventative with certain situations and being able to um, just have a little bit of a wider breadth of knowledge. I think the biggest takeaway I have for you guys is, is don't overcomplicate things. Um, You want to be really good at the basics, especially strength training. Now it doesn't always necessarily need to be boring. Like being good at basics or being simple doesn't always mean boring or, and it definitely doesn't always mean easy. Simple does not mean easy period, but don't rush the process of, of, of some of these movements and, and some of these things that you can do. And then don't get too caught up in the weeds of, Oh, well, this 12 year old athlete on Instagram is, is already doing uh, this movement here or is already lifting X amount of weight or can already jump this high. Mm-hmm. Like it's wasted energy to compare yourself to somebody else or to compare yourself to a different situation. You can only control the situation that you're in currently. Mm-hmm. That's just a great general mindset to have, regardless of if you're training, if you're in volleyball, if you're in some other sports, uh, or you're, if you're an adult, if it's a lot of people that I work with. Uh-huh. The overall message that I have for you guys is just to keep things simple, be great at the fundamentals, and then don't compare yourself to where other people are, and just continuously be working on making yourself better. Because being consistent with the little things makes great progress over time. And that's with strength training. That's with injury prevention. That's with anything. So, wow. Yeah. That's what I've got. Awesome. Well, I'm super, yeah. <laughs> super pumped about this interview. I appreciate you being willing to do this so much. I think it's going to add so much value to everyone that listens. And if you are in the Atlanta area right now, um, reach out to Jacob. He's awesome. Like I said, he'll give you a good workout too. (laughs) Um, (laughs) If you go see him at Stat Wellness. Jacob, how would someone contact you if they wanted to ask you questions, maybe follow up questions from this podcast, or maybe get in touch with you to just see you in your office? How would they contact you? For all you millennials out there, (laughs) or what's the younger one? Is it Generation Z or I have whatever. No idea. Gen Z. <laughs> I don't know. But for all you guys out there, all you athletes out there or whoever, Instagram is a very easy way to get a hold of me. My Instagram handle is Dr. Jacob Swart, Dr. Period Jacob Period Swart. That's an easy way to get a hold of me. I've got a lot of really good information out there that I try to give out to people. But then also my email, you can reach me at jacob at athletespotential.com. Those would probably be the two easiest places to get a hold of me is be either Instagram or my email address. Perfect. Probably, honestly, Instagram. But if you don't have an Instagram account. Because <laughs> we're all on or... Instagram all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. If you don't have an Instagram, you don't want to reach out to me via social media, absolutely feel free to re- reach out to me via email. I'm very responsive to that as well, too. Perfect. All right, Jacob. Well, I will let you go. Again, that was excellent. I was trying to keep notes, but I literally could not write down the amount of information you were giving me. So I'm excited to listen <laughs> back to this and take notes so I can pause and everything and just get all the information. There's so many things that I want to incorporate with uh, my teams moving forward. And I'm really surprised at how many things I thought I knew that like the thinking was off just a little bit or like Mm -hmm. what you said about Mm -hmm. shoes, you know, you would think the the people who had their shoes, yeah, you would think that, oh, well, that would be perfect. But the fact that there's no difference, it's just, you would think. It's mind blowing. So anyway, yeah. okay. I will let you go. Thanks again, everyone for listening to the get the pancake yeah. podcast and we will see you next Sunday.